Uh, our next panel is the state and global capitalism. Uh, we have the privilege of having uh, Professor Jun Zhu of John Jay City University of New York uh, to moderate that panel. And uh, so I'll turn it over right now. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Um, and uh, thanks to all the organizers who have made this event possible. And we have, um, today our panel is on the state and global capitalism. We have a group of uh, outstanding scholars and speakers. Um, uh, without further ado, let me just uh, uh, start with our first speaker, um, Jayati Ghosh. Is, she's a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is an Indian development economist at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her core areas of study include international economics, employment patterns in the global south, uh, macroeconomic policy, and gender and development. Um, Jadi. Thank you so much, Jun. And it's a real privilege to be part of this. Uh, you know, I actually, in India, we grew up intellectually with the Socialist Register. So for me, this, this occasion brings back so many uh, aspects of the ways in which we are intellectually indebted to, to Leo and the, the amazing team that he brought together. And I think among the things that really appeal to us in, in the developing world are the fact that, you know, he never underrated the significance of imperialism at a time when a lot of left scholars in the North were much more internally focused. He, he really kept bringing that up. And that made his work continuously relevant, I think, uh, for us. Also, you know, there was this very strong empirical grounding, but always searching for the deeper relationships and the interrelationships between phenomena. I think Leo also exemplified what you could call the optimism of the will very strongly, despite, uh, I won't say pessimism, but the realism of the intellect. Uh, which of course came out in his writings on social democracy, but also the, the trajectory of global capitalism. When I finally did have the opportunity to meet him personally, I was struck as so many others have been all day today by, you know, just, just the warmth and generosity of his personality, the openness, the ability to engage with so many different people at so many different levels, always with respect. And I think uh, I think it was mentioned at the very beginning that this is something so unusual in academics, but then he was so much more than an academic. So I really do feel deeply privileged to be part of this conversation. So I'm going to try and take forward a little bit the discussion that Leo and Sam Gindin have in their book, remarkable book actually, very prescient, uh, The Making of Global Capitalism. And there are three particular points from that book that I, I want to just take as the base for, for what I want to talk about. And I'm quoting here, I, uh, one of the points they make is that one of capitalism's defining characteristics is the legal and organizational differentiation between the state and the economy. And it's not a separation, it's a differentiation. I think that's very, very important. And I think it helps us to understand uh, the ways in which the state, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, I, I was just in a, a, a discussion right now at the Festival of Economics in Trento, where they talked about the return of the state, which is completely missing the point. <laughs> the state was never away. It was just, it has just changed in the ways in which it interacts and the patterns that it creates. And so I think that's the first very important point. Of course, I think uh, Leo and Sam described this uh, in terms of three features, the rule of law as a liberal political framework for property, competition and contracts, the specialized agencies to facilitate accumulation through regulating markets. And of course, the modes of regulation are now globally important. They're not just national. Uh, they also identified liberal democracy as a modal form of the capitalist state. I don't think that is true anymore. And I don't think any of us here in this group uh, would see that either. And I'm sure they would agree with that today. But I, the second important point that I think uh, I want to just take off from, from that book is that uh, they, they, mo they note that states, capitalist states, came to accept a certain responsibility for reproducing capitalist accumulation internationally. In other words, uh, imperialism, the way I define it, which is the struggle of large capital over economic territory 
and economic territory can be anything from land, labor, natural resources to you know to uh, the cyberspace and so on, um, intellectual property, all of these things. Uh, that uh, international promotion became the active responsibility of states, and that again is something which is deeply true today and cannot uh, we cannot really understand the current conjuncture without that. And finally, I think very important point is that the political fault lines of global capitalism are within states rather than between them. We often forget this. I think even we, you know, would, are in the broad Marxian tradition, we, we try to, we often end up looking at, you know, trying to define particular systems uh, what are they capitalist? Are they, uh, you know, proto capitalist? Are they imperialist? Are they this? Whereas what we really should be looking at are the dynamics within the states and how those then spill over into the global economy and affect global capitalism. So, in this context, in the light of these insights, this is really what a time to, to you know, whenever we talk about things like this, you really do miss Leo because you would really value what would surely be deeply critical and penetrating insights to anything that you said. But anyway, how do we interpret then the current global conjuncture in the light of these three, I would say extremely important and significant points. I think the first point I do believe is that globally we're at some kind of an inflection point in capitalism. Okay, point is not the right term because these are things that last, could last for decades. We are at an inflection phase, if you like, of capitalism. Because what the pandemic has shown is that uh, it has not just shown, I mean, it has repeated because we saw that earlier with the global financial crisis as well. But what it has shown is that, uh, you know, global capitalism is incapable of meeting its own goals. Forget meeting goals of humanity, society, etc. It is incapable of meeting its own goals in terms of, you know, a dynamic productivity increase and, and so on and so forth. Yes, it can generate more profits for particular categories of capital. Uh, but, you know, that, that becomes uh, one of those situations where you're too successful for your own good. The predator eating too much of the prey and therefore eventually being denied of food. And that is evident. It's also true that global capitalism is incapable of creating resilient economies. So in both senses, it's, it's not up to the mark. You know? It's not delivering in its own terms. Now, what that means then is that the criticality of the state is even more important. I believe that in the US, they've re realized this. You see the resurgence of active state intervention in different ways from those of the past. I mean, tax cuts are also state intervention, right? Uh, deregulation of the environment that was going on in the previous years, all of these are also state intervention. But now we see a more proactive attempt to uh, reintroduce certain kinds of regulatory practices that are more legitimizing for capitalism within the advanced countries. And so there is a recognition of this particular issue within advanced economies. However, that broader recognition for the whole of the world and for the global economy, that has not seeped in. For at least the G7 leaders, if I may put it that way, you know, for the, the rulers of the world defined as advanced economy, uh, advanced capitalist economy leaders, okay? What do you get there for? You get uh, sort of uh, outcomes in this post pandemic era, which are, they've been described as K-shaped. Everybody loves the alphabet in these matters, uh, deeply inequalizing, but essentially for the greater part of the global population, you're getting a triple whammy. You are getting, of course, the continued spread of disease because of vaccine nationalism, the insistence on intellectual property rights, the restrictions on supply, and the grabbing of whatever supplies are available at one level, which means the disease will continue for the developing world. You have their inability to expand public investment so that 11 countries have accounted for nearly 90% of all the increased fiscal expenditure since January 2020. That is during the entire pandemic, 10 advanced economies have accounted for 80%, China has accounted for 8%, the rest of the world 
So the average fiscal stimulus in the United States has been $25,000 per capita before the latest Biden plans. The average fiscal stimulus in the low income countries has been $2 per capita. So that's the kind of difference we're talking about. And of course, that in turn is now associated with the third whammy. Because remember, these are also countries with more informal workers. 70% of the workers are informal. In some countries, 90%. There's no legal protection, no social protection, no compensation, no automatic stabilizers. So the economic devastation is massive across the developing world. Then you are now getting the third whammy in terms of rising commodity prices, precisely because of recovery in these advanced economies and of greater pressure on credit markets because once again, bond markets, I mean, you'd rather put your money in the advanced economies which are set to grow once again. And so a tightening of credit access in the developing world. And so the spillover effects of these, this expansion in the developing world are a worsening condition. Now, I believe that this is giving us an inflection point because uh, I know that there was just, um, Minchi Li was just talking about the internal dynamics of China, but there are the external dynamics of China. And we are clearly in a period of, shall we say, I mean, it's not a, there is a decline in the US hegemony. It's not evident necessarily that China is uh, able to take up that slack and become, but certainly there is a period of uh, uncertainty, shall we say. And remember, previous periods of transition of global hegemony have lasted for decades. So it's not something you're expecting to happen tomorrow or day after. So we are getting a major delegitimization of the advanced economy's control over global capitalism at a time when there is a potential hegemon in the wings with a different form of capitalism, whatever you want to call it, a different form of patterns of intervention and regulation of markets and different forms of also integration. So how that plays out, I don't think we know. I don't think we are able to actually necessarily identify exactly which way this will go. But I do believe that this is something that in subsequent periods will be seen as that very critical decade when lots of things happened. Uh, if you go back to the Great Depression, none of the headlines said, this is the Great Depression. <laughs> I'm sure 10 years from now, people will recognize this period as a very, very significant period that we're in the middle of. And I do believe that many of the analytical tools that Leo and, and Sam and Greg and all the others have brought to bear on understanding these capitalist processes are going to be of immense use in helping us to understand them today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jadi, for such, for such a powerful uh, talk. Um, next, we have um, uh, Nicole Ashoff. Um, she's an editor at Versal Books and the author of The New Profits of Capital. Her most recent book is The Smartphone Society, Technology, Power, and Resistance, in The New Gilded Age. Mm, thank you. Nicole. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank the organizers of this panel for inviting me here today. It's my pleasure to be able to share with you some thoughts and memories of Leo and also to just talk about what I think some of the significant orienting ideas that I've developed and that Leo really impressed upon me in terms of my intellectual development over the years and also some of the kind of big questions that he left unanswered for us and some of the um, directions that he pointed to um, in terms of our struggle. So I'm, I'm really thankful to be here today. And I, I'm going to read just because I feel a little emotional and I wanted to make sure that I said what I wanted to say. So apologies in advance, um, but it won't be too long. Um, I met Leo for the first time more than 20 years ago, actually, at Left Forum, um, which back then was still called the Socialist Scholars Conference. Uh, Leo was on a panel talking about the evolution of global capitalism in the post-World War II period or something along those lines. Um, and I had just read the long 20th century. So of course, I wanted to know what Leo thought about systemic cycles of accumulation and to ask him whether that framework wasn't a better way to think about the evolution of global capitalism. 
looking back, I'm not sure where I found the nerve. I was still an undergrad who knew next to nothing about political economy uh, or global capitalism. Um, and it actually wasn't until some years later when my research on the global auto industry led me to Sam and through Sam that I actually got to know Leo um, and the incredible global network of scholars connected to the Socialist Register. But when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, um, I kept coming back to my first interaction with Leo at the Left Forum. And I think what struck me that day and has remained with me since was Leo's open-mindedness both to the fumbling inquiries of a young scholar and also to the potential intellectual value of a theoretical framework that he didn't particularly agree with. So I think more broadly, one of the things that made Leo special was the way in which his personal character and his scholarship mapped onto one another. I think one facet of this mapping, which is evident in Leo's work on the state and global capitalism is what Giovanni used to call uh, analytical nerve, Leo's analytical nerve, or more plainly, his boldness. Leo was always a snappy dresser, but he never succumbed to intellectual fads or fashions. And I think um, when we're thinking about, you know, the state and global capitalism, globalization in particular is, is a perfect example of this. Um, in the 90s, and of course you know this, the two, in the 2000s, the dominant frame for understanding the evolution of capitalism was the globalization discourse. Practitioners in this intellectual landscape often clustered themselves into opposing camps of hyperglobalists, which included both the doomsdayers and, and champions, um, and globalization skeptics people who either saw the withering of the state and the vanishing significance of the nation as an object of inquiry, or who denied the long-term significance of trends toward global integration. Leo never fell prey to these intellectual dead ends. Instead, he attacked questions around globalization and by extension, neoliberalism and financialization with empirical rigor and conceptual clarity. He never skipped over asking the fundamental questions. His insistence on the centrality of the state in the management and development of global capitalism, when others had moved on to sexier topics, provided a crucial critical framework for understanding the end of history. It enabled us to see globalization, neoliberalism, and financialization as the products of a social, political, and economic restructuring of capitalism engineered by states and corporations, rather than the ineluctable spinning out of the market fueled by natural drives. This way of thinking was really crucial to my own intellectual development. In February of 2008, Sam invited me to, to York to talk about my research on the auto industry, both the case study that I was doing on Delphi, which is the former in-house uh, in parts manufacturer of General Motors, and the database that I was constructing on restructuring in the North American auto industry. Despite the blistering cold Toronto winter and being nearly seven months pregnant, uh, it was an exhilarating trip. Being able to share my somewhat idiosyncratic interests and research passions with a group of like-minded scholars was exciting and helped push me through the lonely slog of writing a dissertation. A few years later, Leo asked me to synthesize my dissertation research in an article for the Socialist Register, discussing the restructuring of the auto industry after the 2008 financial crisis. I was immensely grateful for this opportunity, in part because writing this piece allowed me to clarify my thinking about the evolution of the auto industry, and specifically how the US state's response to the financial crisis was reshaping the terrain of struggle for US workers, but also because writing that piece brought me into the Socialist Register orbit, a unique space for critical and holistic thinking that so many of us here today appreciate and treasure. And I think just as an aside, um, one of the best ways that we can honor Leo's legacy is to help Greg and the, the whole Register crew 
um, keep it alive and, and thriving. And so I really, um, you know, I'm going to try to help Greg as much as I can. And I really encourage everyone else to, to, to put some of their efforts and time into keeping the register going, because I think it's a really valuable um, space for intellectual inquiry. But Leo's insistence that we keep our eye on institutions and their political dimensions also meant that when we were trying to make sense of the world in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, we had the intellectual tools to do so. When otherwise sensible people were pointing the finger at a few greedy bankers or mass amnesia or predicting the end of capitalism, Leo was able to situate the crisis within a broader historically grounded framework. His body of intellectual work insisted that we examine the crisis through the lens of global capitalism as superintended by the US state. It insisted that we connect the financial meltdown to past crises, and importantly, that we pay attention to how states were managing the crisis in the moment, and thus how capitalism was evolving in the moment, rather than succumbing to hysteria-tinged speculation about what would happen when capitalism collapsed. In the years after the financial crisis and following the election of Donald Trump, Leo, Sam, Greg, and the crew of the Register provided a crucial bulwark against catastrophism. Central to this effort has been an insistence on reckoning with the tensions and uncertainties of the crisis and its aftermath. Reckoning with how capital and the ruling class have been remarkably successful in engineering their recovery to their own benefit, how despite the loss of legitimacy of neoliberalism and US-led global, US global leadership, the structures of US-led capitalism have proven flexible and robust. And exploring the ways forward in a crisis that is felt primarily in the pain visited upon the working class and ecological destruction, rather than a deterioration of opportunities for profit making. The value of Leo's bold clarity was, of course, not just intellectual, it was also political. I think in many ways, declinism, which is how Sam kind of, sum, kind of sums it up, and the resigned waiting practiced by many on the left who explicitly, or at least implicitly, believe that the collapse of capitalism will automatically open a space for progressive movements to flourish, has been as damaging to efforts to build alternatives to capitalism as the belief that there is no alternative. Leo's resistance to declinism offered particularly important lessons over the past year, when progressive commentators blithely discussed the United States as a failed state with little regard for the political implications of that framing. Leo's resistance to declinism was rooted in his insistence on empirically grounded arguments and perhaps a broader commitment to truth, capital T, but he was also an optimist, a second way in which his character and scholarship mapped onto each other. As a young socialist, Leo's optimism for me was both a balm and a model for how to live life as a member of a team that was usually losing. To be sure, Leo wasn't a cheerleader and didn't think revolution was around the corner. But he believed in the power of ideas. In fact, when I think about the times that I hung out with Leo, often at Left Forum with Greg and Sam when he could be roped into coming down, or events in Toronto, it always struck me how hungry Leo was for information. He always wanted to know what I was reading, what I was thinking about, what I was writing, who I was talking to. He was like this with everyone. He was constantly talking to activists, to labor organizers, to elected officials, to grad students, and of course his comrades the world over. I think Leo's voraciousness reflected an impatience with scholars who relied upon algorithmic approaches to understanding economic shifts or whose arguments trailed the headlines. Leo was always looking for new data to test and evolve his theories. His analyses of how states were managing capitalism or how political movements were responding to this management were shaped by information from real struggles, often happening in the moment. He studied large structures and big processes, but never lost sight of the fact that these structures and processes were composed of the beliefs, 
norms, and actions of everyday people and communities. And that to change capitalism required dogged struggle from below, informed by a sober, empirically grounded understanding of the institutions we're hoping to transform. In this regard, Leo's optimism extended beyond his belief in the power and importance of ideas to a belief in the power of people to change the world and build something better than capitalism. His belief was tempered by a deep skepticism of social democracy and the shortcuts offered by movementism, but ultimately Leo remained a socialist. This sounds simple, but as someone who came of age in a time of total defeat, Leo's core belief in the power of democratic struggle to empower working people to build something better than capitalism was incredibly important to me. It gave me the confidence to believe and to spread some optimism of my own. In short, I think Leo modeled how to be an intellectual. For him, the quest for truth wasn't about being right or being admired, though he was both of those things. It was about the power of ideas to both help us understand the world around us and to lift us up, to bring us together in struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing the thoughts and also the memories of Neil. Um, our next um, speaker is Clyde Barrow. He's a professor of political science at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Uh, his recent books include The Dangerous Class, the concept of the nonpoint proletariat, and towards a political theory of states, the Palancas Miliband debate after globalization. So, hi. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here today. It's been a really excellent experience. A lot of great panels and, and great panelists have given me uh, much to think about. Uh, I'm going to start with sharing a few personal memories of, of Leo Panich, and then I'll give a highly abbreviated version uh, of the remarks that I had prepared in advance today, uh, talking about Leo Panich and, and the theory of the state. Uh, I can't say it's the first time that I met Leo Panich, but it's the first time that I saw Leo Panich was, I believe, in 1978, while I was in my second year of graduate school at UCLA. Uh, this was a year after he had published his first book, The Canadian State. And I remember one of my friends uh, excitedly coming up to me in the hall one day uh, saying that Leo Panich is coming to talk. Uh, we have to go. And my initial response was, uh, who is Leo Panich? And his response was, well, he's the Canadian Ralph Miliband. And so I immediately decided that that was worthy of my attention and that I had to go. And of course, it was a packed room with standing room only, but needless to say, his reputation as, as a theorist of the state had already been established uh, at the very moment when we were coming at, to the end of the miliband palancis debate. I actually didn't get to meet him until almost 20 years later, and it was at that special conference on the miliband palancis debate uh, that was organized in 1997 by Peter Bratzis uh, at CUNY uh, there was about a hundred of us there, as I recall. Uh, it was really a turning point in my thinking about the theory of the state. Uh, and it was the first time I actually got to meet with and, and have a conversation with Leo and came to realize that, that we share a lot in common in terms of our thinking on these issues. And it was out of that conference that his piece, The Impoverishment of State Theory, uh, emerged. That was the talk that he had given in that conference. After that, we tended to cross paths sporadically, uh, usually at annual meetings of that abomination known as the American Political Science Association. Uh, but the last time that I saw him uh, was in uh, November of last year. Uh, I had invited him to zoom in to speak to my political theory class. Uh, we were talking about globalization theory and state theory and, and he graciously accepted my invitation. Uh, I, I don't know whether this was just before or just after he had been diagnosed with his illness, but I could tell at the time that, that something was amiss. He was not his usual ebullient self. So I was worried that was he upset with me for interrupting his time in retirement to, to come in and talk to my class. But I wrote to him the next morning to thank him and I didn't hear back from him, which was very unusual. 
And it was only a month later uh, that I received notice that he had passed away. Uh, needless to say, it was a very sad day. At any rate, uh, getting to the state, one of the last conversations I had with him face to face uh, was with Leo in his car. And I know exactly the date. It was February 10th of, of 2021, or was it? Very, well, no, I don't remember the date, the, de the date. But it was at Stephen Marr's dissertation defense. So you'll remember that. We were driving to a reception following the dissertation defense. Uh, I just completed a much longer version of a paper uh, that I'll use as a platform for my discussion today. Leo had read the draft uh, and he made a few minor biographical corrections at the time. And, but I, I told him, I said, you know, Leo, if we had all just taken your advice in 1997, uh, it would have saved us about 20 years of wandering in the wilderness of state theory. And he just smiled at me and said, uh, damn it, Clyde, don't tell me that now. Uh, he said he had thought about writing a book on the theory of the state at the time, but it just seemed to him that the collapse of corporatism and the aggressive attacks on organized labor seemed like a more pressing issue uh, than to wade into the abstract fury uh, that was known as the state debate at the time. Uh, but it's a book that, that didn't get written, so perhaps uh, there's a young Leo out there still waiting to write that book. And so I'm just going to make a, a few comments from that, which is that, as we all remember, or some of us remember, after we don't all remember, 1976, uh, the Palancas Miliband debate on Marx's state theory had just reached its conclusion in what appeared to be a profoundly disappointing stalemate between what were then the world's two most renowned Marxist theorists of the state, Ralph Miliband and Nico Palancis. The exchange, as I argue, was a, a paradigmatic event because it set in motion a much broader state debate that at the time seemed to fracture Marxist political theory into warring schools of thought. Nevertheless, the, the miliband palancis debate echoed widely across the 1970s and following their initial exchange, political theorists around the world quickly lined up around the question of whether Miliband's instrumentalism or Palancis' structuralism could rightly claim to be the Marxist theory of the state. And I note that both of them rejected those labels. These were not self-identifiers. Uh, neither of them accepted the label that was imposed upon them from the outside. Uh, but that is how the debate came to be understood for at least the next two decades. There was one notable exception to that polarization, and it appeared a year after the conclusion of the miliband palancis debate, and it was Leo Panitch, who at the time was a young Canadian political scientist at Carleton University, and I'd argue that he had pointed the way beyond that impasse in a book called The Canadian State, Political Economy, and Political Power. When the book was released, the publisher advertised it as a powerful collection of essays. And while reviewers are generally skeptical of Marxism did not fully agree with that assessment, they did agree that the 15 chapter book displayed a remarkable thematic consistency, primarily due to Leo's introductory essay, which integrated the works of Ralph Miliband, Nico Palancis, and James O'Connor into what one reviewer called a coherent perspective on the state. Now, at the time, Miliband, Palancis, and O'Connor were probably the three leading state theorists, uh, although they were all viewed as proposing mutually exclusive theories of the state. In contrast, Panitch's success in blending those theoretical works into a coherent perspective was praised as a signal contribution to Marxist political theory. The book sold thousands of copies, and on the 40th anniversary of its publication, it was still being described as a remarkably influential collection of essays. And his essay was a, really sought to identify the skeletal framework for a Marxist theory of states, and I emphasize the world plural, by defining what he called the three requisites for such a theory in light of the impasse left behind by the Palancis Miliband debate. Now, I could go on at great length uh, in describing these, but I'll try to summarize this, this very quickly. Uh, Panitch argued that there were three requisites for developing a theory of the state and capitalist society. The first, he said, was it must clearly delimit the complex of institutions to go make up the state. 
And in that respect, I would suggest that he was really ahead of uh, the so-called new institutionalists that came out uh, more than a decade later. He was very much in sympathy with Miliband on this point, that if one was going to study the state, you had to study it in terms of its actually existing concrete institutional arrangements and their political development across history, that you couldn't just engage in abstract theorizing, you had to study real existing states. The second point he said was that it must demonstrate concretely rather than define abstractly the linkages between the state and the system of class inequality in society, particularly its ties to the dominant class. And this of course was one of the main sticking points of controversy between Miliband and Palancis at the time. Uh, Leo's argument was, it's certainly true what Miliband says that the state can act as a capital state regardless of who actually holds governmental power, which is different from the state. Uh, but he had two points to make about that. The first was uh, Miliband's representation of that concept was very abstract, virtually metaphysical, and that it hadn't yet moved to the state of actually telling us what those structural linkages and structural mechanisms were. And there were many people who came out of that, most importantly, Klaus Ofa uh, and his dependency principle which uh, Ofa, um, excuse me, Panitch actually integrated into his pantheon of great thinkers uh, by about uh, soon after that. Uh, and the other, he said, was that the talk about who actually sits in government, he said, well, it was beside the point that if you were talking about a place like Canada or the United States, it was just simply an empirical fact that the capitalist class did occupy a lot of the sites of political power and exercise a great deal of direct influence over governmental policy. So whether a state had to be capitalist in the sense of capitalist holding power, uh, it was just a fact that in some states it were, and, and that was his point was, you have to look at each state individually and you have to actually do an empirical, historical, institutional analysis of that state in order to understand it, which led him to the point that there was no theory of the state. Uh, there were theoretically informed analyses of states. And finally, he says it had to specify the possible functions of the state under the capitalist mode of production. He agreed with Ofa and O'Connor on this point that the two main functions that make a state a capitalist state was the promotion of capital accumulation, uh, which stems from its dependency on the state, uh, excuse me, its dependency on capital for tax revenues, and that in a liberal democratic form of state, it also had to pursue legitimacy which generated the entire complex of institutions, policies, and activities that we generically know as the welfare state. Now, Panitch was probably the only state theorist at the time, and maybe for the next two decades, who argued that each of those three approaches, are represented by Miliband, Palancis, and O'Connor, had each made a contribution to answering one of those three questions. So rather than seeing their works as incompatible or as warring schools of thought, Panic suggested that the insights of each theorist could be integrated into concrete analyses of actually existing states and their political development, and that when one pursued state theory at that level, all of these sort of analytic wars would sort of evaporate. And of course, you will never find Leo engaged in these long disquisitions about epistemology. Uh, just wasn't something that he talked about. And he did anchor this in Marx's uh, volume three of Capital. Now to conclude my remarks today, I'll just say that I do think that he would today agree that there's a fourth basic requisite of state theory. And I know he would agree because he told me. Uh, and it's that we must not only situate states in capitalist societies concretely, but we now must locate them in the chain of global capital accumulation and the extended reproduction of capitalism on a global scale, which was, of course, the, the, really the point of his last great project with Sam Jindan on the making of global capitalism. And he was very proud of the fact uh, that, it, that he was one of the first, really in 1994 and 1996 in two essays, uh, where he later reflected back and said that it was in those two essays that I contested the widespread notion that capital had bypassed or escaped the diminished power or diminished the power of the state, that he really challenged directly uh, this basic thesis of hyperglobalization that one found in people like Thomas Friedman and others, that the state had become irrelevant. 
In fact, he argued that to properly make sense of globalization, we cannot do without many of the tools of analysis of Marxist state theory, because it was states that had been the principal agents and organizers of globalization led by the hegemony of, of the American state. Uh, and so at the end, he emphasized that even in the midst of globalization, the Marxist theory of the state remains salient and the study of the capitalist state today must still meet the original three requisites that he had outlined for developing such a theory in the Canadian state some 34 years ago. Thank and you so much, Clyde. Mm -hmm. uh, remarks. Thanks for, for those, uh, for the talk and um, sh reviewing uh, Leo's contribution to the Marxian theory of state. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Doug Hanwood. Um, he's an American journalist, uh, economic analyst, author, and a financial trader who writes frequently about economic affairs. Until 2013, he published a newsletter, A Left Business Observer, that analyzes economics and politics from a left-wing perspective. Um, he is the author of Wall Street, How It Works and For Whom. Hi, thank you, and uh, it's a real honor uh, to be here um, with a distinguished roster of fellow participants paying homage to a man I admired as a thinker and cherished as a friend. Last time I saw him was just before a lockdown in March of last year. He, was, in fact, was our second to last dinner guest, and we wondered if what we were doing was wise. Little did we know at the time. I want to apologize for being a provincial American in my remarks, but since the U.S. state was central to the making of global capitalism, the state of the American state is deeply, re deeply relevant to that making or unmaking. For the past 15 years, I've been dancing around a project on the American ruling class, what it is, how it works, and why it seems so damn rotten. By dancing around, I mean reading, thinking, interviewing people, and writing shorter essays that were part of the project, but I never really got around to turning it into a book, my eventual goal, along with the socialist revolution, of course. I took a big step towards that eventual goal with a very long essay published in the most recent Jacobin, Bhaskar Sankara commissioned it in February 2020, in the last few weeks before we didn't have to think about COVID, expanding a 2,000 word essay in about a month. A year later, I delivered something eight times that long. I started thinking about the topic of the ruling class back in the George W. Bush years. After a pointless round of tax cuts skewed towards the very rich, Bush and his cronies launched a horribly destructive and expensive war in Iraq that served no imperial purpose and greatly damaged the reputation and finances of the U.S. on its own imperial terms. One waited in vain for some grown-ups to appear on the scene and right the imperial ship, but if they existed at all, they were too busy celebrating their tax cuts and pumping up the housing bubble to bother. After that bubble burst, creating the financial crisis in the Great Recession, the smooth and cerebral Barack Obama seemed, seemed like a stabilizing force. But he had no real, lasting, uh, no real lasting systemic effect, and the disappointments of the Obama years prepared the way for Trump. Once again, during the Trump years, one waited in vain for the grown-ups to show up. But tax cuts and deregulation made the big bourgeoisie forget all their reservations about him, and the stock market made on average a fresh high once every week between his inauguration and the onset of the corona crisis. A core concept of Marxism is class struggle, but the tradition exhibits a strange dearth of uh, opinion on the ruling class. When I first started getting interested in elite studies, I asked Bertel Ullman whose writing he liked on the issue. He said, Marxists don't write about the ruling class. When I asked why not, he said, they think it's obvious. It's not obvious, though. You could say the ruling class is the capitalist class, of course, but what exactly does that mean? CEOs of the Fortune 500? Their shareholders? How about provincial car dealers? If so, what about new versus used cars? What about somebody like Henry Kissinger, a man who started as a clever functionary and ended up shaping U.S. foreign policy for decades and still has an influence on how diplomats and politicians think? And what about less grand politicians and high government officials, employees of the ruling class or its partners or shapers even? It's not at all obvious. Leo was very helpful to me over the years in thinking this project through. At, his earliest, at its earliest stages, he commissioned a piece for the 2006 Socialist Register on the business community, which got the ball rolling for me, though very slowly. And in subsequent years, he had me write essays on the rise of the right of the U.S. for the 2016 and 19 editions. But there are a couple of key insights I picked up from reading and talking to Leo, perhaps most importantly, that classes ruling or working don't really organize themselves. They need to be organized by parties, political figures, and states. 
As Leo once put it, there's no idealized capitalist who picks up the phone and tells the president what to do. Presidents, finance ministers, and legislators all respond to the preferences of the capitalist class, but those preferences are often not rigorously thought through. There are moments like the mid to late 1970s in the US where the capitalists do organize themselves. Then they created the Business Roundtable and other lobbying organizations to push deregulation, cuts in social spending, and crackdowns to organized labor. But even in that case, the founding wasn't entirely on the executive's initiative. They needed political actors to prod them. When visiting Washington in 1971, John Harper, then CEO of Alcoa, was urged by Treasury Secretary John Connolly and Fed Chair Arthur Burns to form a nonpartisan lobbying group for big business as a whole, something that had never existed before. There were specific trade associations, but nothing to represent the whole crew. Harper and several colleagues founded the Roundtable in 1973, an early sign that capital was becoming a class for itself, one capable of consciously organizing to pursue its own power and interests. This is not the cartoon view of things in which the capitalists pull the strings of their political puppets. Having achieved pretty much everything they wanted to by the early years of the Reagan administration, the capitalists essentially demobilized. As Lee Drutman shows in his history of lobbying, Having created an infrastructure for politicking, the focus of business narrowed dramatically to sectoral and even firm-specific issues. Its fragmentation was so complete that it was unable or unwilling to mobilize when a posse of hopped-up reactionary GOP backbenchers shut down the government and threatened default on treasury bonds. In an interview, Drutman explained to me this silence as a symptom of, capitalism's, of capital's narrowing field of vision. It's a business-wide issue, and they're all looking out for their own narrow interests. Business rarely lobbies as a whole. Success has fractured them. When there is a lot at stake, it was easy to unify. They have felt like they're up against big government and big labor. But once you don't have a common energy, uh, enemy, the efforts become more diffuse. There's not a sense of business organized as a responsible class. Drutman's uh, comments go to a long way to explain the missing grown-up problem. There is, however, an exception, the right wing, which for decades has been extremely well organized in the U.S., in the immediate post-World War II decades, the right was extremely marginal. The Republican Party hadn't embraced the inheritance of the New Deal enthusiastically, but neither did it reject it entirely. That made the hard right quite angry. Many of the leading figures of that right had come out of the communist and Trotskyist parties in the 1930s, and they carried with them those formations organizational and ideological discipline. They set about to take over the Republican Party, and they were supported financially by a provincial petty bourgeoisie. As those decades progressed, those moneymen, rarely inhabitants of commanding heights, endowed think tanks like Heritage and Cato to do the thinking for a business class distinctly unable to think much on their own. The right eventually succeeded in taking over the GOP, armed with a set of policies developed by those think tanks. Their opening to state power came when the broad capitalist class, the big CEOs of the business roundtable and such, were open to an undoing of the New Deal and the embrace of a seriously right-wing agenda. But the big capitalists weren't initially screaming for Reagan. They had to be pulled in his direction. Walter Riston, the influential, influential chair of Citibank from 1967 to 1984, said that his Eastern business set had underestimated Reagan's skills and his great political strength. His crowd initially preferred a more orthodox candidate like former Texas Governor John Connolly, who prodded the existence of the Business Roundtable, or George Bush for the presidency in 1980. But they came around. David Rockefeller provided the ultimate endorsement. My enthusiasm has grown. I didn't adequately recognize the strength of his leadership. Rockefeller's conversion to Reaganism came about despite the early conservative movement's longstanding view of his family as the enemy incarnate. The Reagan years and their aftermath created a new set of billionaires who displaced the old WASP elite, which by the 1970s had lost most of their fortunes and their social prestige. A transition created a whole new constituency for even more right-wing policies developed by a far thicker network of think tanks, think tanks and university-based intellectuals and funded with nearly unlimited pots of cash raised by Charles Koch and his cronies. I want to underscore the point that this right doesn't occupy the commanding heights of the American economy. If you look at the board and the funders of Heritage and Cato, you still find a provincial petty bourgeoisie, one that's richer, more numerous, and largely controls one of our two major political parties. But despite that uh, not occupying those commanding heights, they're very disciplined and organized. And despite how nutty they often seem, the leadership of the Republican Party is also extremely energized and organized. Unlike their Democratic counterparts, they have a set of principles, 
it's only a slight oversimplification to summarize those principles as let the money do as they like, let the poor starve and let the earth burn up. They also have a strong sense of party discipline. Watching Biden now pathetically searching for bipartisan cooperation with a group of people who passionately want to see him fail is surreal and depressing. Part of the Democrats' problem is that they're fundamentally a party of capital that has to pretend otherwise for electoral purposes. That fundamental contradiction is what makes them look spineless and vacillating. In many ways, the Democratic Party of the 1990s had become a vehicle for Wall Street in the Fortune 500, fiscally conservative, no friends of labor, temperamentally cautious. But that didn't really uh, pan out. There's just no vigor there uh, in, any, in any meaningful sense as either political figures or um, generators of policy ideas. In the early days of the Biden administration, I thought it was possible that he might lead some sort of renovation of the corporate class. One that, is, one that at least in part has been making noises about wanting to reduce inequality, rebuild our rotting infrastructure and address the climate crisis. You hear that sort of thing out of the business roundtable of today and also uh, out of BlackRock, um, the, the giant money manager. Of course, they want all those things that uh, reducing inequality, rebuilding the rotting infrastructure and addressing the climate crisis. They want all that done cautiously. They would not involve an embrace of eco-socialism, but it would have marked a departure in American politics towards a model very different from the one has predominated for the last 40 years. Biden's dithering, uh, dithering in recent months, though, has made me step away from this conjecture. Maybe it will return, but I'm not going to bet on it. What's going on here? The reformist wing of the capitalist class may not be numerous or pow powerful enough to provide the political impetus, but that's not all. Another problem is the devolution of the political class. Biden is just no FDR or LBJ, masterful politicians with strong personalities who knew how to work the systems to push things somewhat forward. Which brings me back to what I said earlier and what I learned from Leo. Without prodding by politicians with some skill and vision, not much is going to happen. The contrast with the organization and fervor of the right as political class or subclass is striking. So here we are with a capitalist class interested only in the accumulation of the maximum amount of money in the shortest possible time and hang the consequences and a political class unable to do much of anything. That could leave a giant opening for the left if we're up to the task. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug, for sharing your thoughts on the American ruling class and also the memory of, of Leo. Um, our next speaker is uh, Richard Wall. He's a professor of economic emeritus at University of Massachusetts Amherst and a visiting professor of the New School for Social Research in New York City. He is the founder of Democracy at Work, and his latest book is The Sickness is the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us. Thank you all. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to hear uh, the talks that I have just finished uh, listening to. I want to begin by saying that I feel a little bit like Nicole did before, that uh, my own development was shaped in important ways by interactions with Leo. Um, and I likewise uh, want to share all of your sense of his importance over the last half century. And it's really that that I want to address uh, myself. I was first connected to Leo through Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff, who were teachers of mine and uh, made me aware of who Leo was, et cetera, et cetera. And that's my, my connection. Um, I think for me, the most valuable thing about Leo uh, was similar to what was for me the most valuable thing about Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff which is they kept both the socialist broadly defined and the Marxist a little bit less broadly defined traditions alive, exciting, sharing those with young people like me uh, in ways that stimulated us at the university, that stimulated us to think politically. Uh, and given what the Western world, particularly the United States and Canada, but the Western world generally uh, went through over the last half century or so, uh, keeping this tradition alive in a vital way was, and in my mind remains, absolutely crucial. An invaluable contribution articulated in the pages of the Socialist Register often, but in a more general way by everything that Leo did 
his conferences, uh, his connection of people, his care in the research he did and what he commented on. Uh, I could go on all day about it. But I want to talk about why it's significant. I think Leo, and here obviously I'm talking a little bit about myself, uh, which I guess all of us uh, are doing at least a bit, uh, had to deal with the fact that in the aftermath of World War II, many of the hopes and dreams that had become excited, provoked, um, were pretty well and systematically undone. Um, the heroic resistance against the Nazis across Europe, all that had involved socialists and communists and Marxists and anarchists, that had in the end played an important role in the defeat of fascism, a fascism to which the capitalist system turned out of the catastrophe of the Great Depression, uh, to watch that heroic period become undone in the years after 1945 was, I think, devastating. Whether it was conscious in everyone's mind or not, it was devastating. When you add to that the revelations about what had happened in those, in the most important early experiment in social, building socialism, the Soviet Union, and all that had become known during the 30s and 40s and so forth, to offset the victory of the Red Army on the one hand, by the revelations of Stalin and all the rest of it on the other, must have been, whatever your criticisms of that early experiment were, devastating on multiple levels. And finally, the rollback of the New Deal, the rollback of the social democracy that came out of capitalism's near collapse in the 1930s, that too must have added to the sense that I certainly picked up from Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff, people with whom I worked very closely, but also from Leo. These were very difficult decades. The hopes, the dreams of what revolution might mean, what a surging socialism could achieve beyond the defeat of Nazism, uh, all of that was undone. And I think for many of them, and I suspect this is true of Leo, uh, it made them very, very cautious, lest we get our hopes up again about either a declining capitalism on the one hand, or what the prospects for socialism and Marxism might be. So yes, you hold on, and Leo did. And yes, you stay with that intellectual tradition, Leo did and you push it forward, Leo did, but you do so with more than a little bit of empathy for Gramsci's notion of the pessimism of the intellect. And I think the model there is Marx himself. Marx too, after the revolutions of 1848, and again, after the Paris Commune in 1871, was deeply disappointed and it shaped his life and his work. And so I, even that is built in, and I think was absorbed by Leo as it was by many others, myself included. And yet Leo held on to an idea, which he articulated to me on more than one occasion, and which I want to share with you now. And that is that the idea, his idea was, that capitalism has always been vulnerable, that it, we shouldn't look at it historically that, well, feudalism lasted a thousand years or more in Europe and slavery many centuries, and that somehow capitalism is governed by the historicity of these other systems. It isn't. Capitalism has its own contradictions, its own methods of movement and change. And whether it will last 200 years or 600 years is an open question. It has to do with its own contradictions, its own dialectics, 
and with the movements of opposition and criticism that capitalism itself has always generated. Marx was once a want to say that his views, his own thinking, Marxism, is capitalism's shadow. It can't get rid of it. Like every other system, it produces and reproduces its own criticism. And eventually, that criticism will kill it. How did Leo understand, in my judgment, the continuous vulnerability of capitalism, the fact that whether it's global or not, whether it has a powerful state or not, a well-organized state or not, there are some fundamental problems this system has that make it forever vulnerable and therefore give the substance to a Marxist and or socialist critical project. Number one, the system is unspeakably unstable. For most of my years as a teacher, at this point in a comparable lecture, I would lean across the podium and stare at my students and say something like this. If you lived with a roommate as unstable as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. Every four to seven years, wherever it settles, on average, it crashes. This is a lunatic system. We've had three crashes in the first 20 years of this century, right on schedule, every seven years on average. Only these three have been really bad, particularly the last two. Wow, a system with a built-in instability that shakes it often to its foundations. Not always, but often. Number two, the system produces inequality. It is a tendential inequality producer. You know, we have uh, the recent spate of um, Piketty and Saez to tell us once again how that works and why that works, but we kind of knew it. It's an old idea, but this building of inequality again undercuts this system. And Leo said to me once, this is a perpetual problem for this system that periodically becomes more than the continuing problem, it becomes the urgent problem. Number three, the system is built on profit. Profit is gathered by those who own and operate capital. That's a small minority of the population. The vast majority are employees. They are not employers. They don't get the profit. A system that says profit maximization is the road to efficiency is a thinly disguised way of saying what this system should be focused on is that which goes to the minority that sits at the top. This is so blatantly unfair, undemocratic, unequal, that the system, which is constantly exposed, as for example, in my, in my profession, economics, where we teach everybody how and why profit should be the bottom line, where every school of business administration teaches the young people getting their master's degree, why focusing on profit is the royal road to what we should all be doing. When this is revealed to people as a special pleading for that minority of the population that gets the profit, it's kind of standing there naked. And history can make that nakedness extremely vulnerable. Okay, I think what Leo's project was, it was to make sure that those vulnerabilities are something we constantly remind everybody of, that as the system exhibits one or another of these in sharp, stark forms, we're there to help masses of people draw the conclusions about this system's problem. Leo always said, at least in my presence, 
that the Marxist analytic was the grasping of the systemic problem that we have. Leo and I did not agree on a number of things and we sometimes had public disputes about them. One of them had to do with something that many of you have brought up. It is in my own opinion, that's all it is, uh, capitalism has reached a point of pretty serious self-destruction and that it is exposing its vulnerabilities on multiple of these long-standing levels. I understand and appreciate why Leo was hesitant to talk about the decline of the system, having been disappointed about earlier thoughts to that effect. And he was often quite perceptive in explaining how this, this decline was over expected by others and at other times. But like the broken clock, it's right on time twice a day. It may have been a mistake before, it doesn't make it a mistake now. I think the center of capitalism's dynamism has left Western Europe and North America and Japan and has moved somewhere else and you all know where. And however we dance around it, that also adds to all the internal vulnerabilities of the capitalism in the United States and Western Europe, the presence of a competitor, the likes of which we have not seen for almost a century. And I think Leo would have been with us here today had we been so fortunate and we would have had a very good conversation. To conclude again, on what is for me the most important point. Leo and Sam and the whole crew in Canada have been an absolutely crucial maintainer of the critical tradition, whether we call it socialism or Marxism, that has been what has been crucial in my development and I know hundreds of other people, including most of my students who have benefited over the years from that as well. We all owe him an enormous debt of gratitude, which I am very happy uh, to offer and to pay him and to pay those of you, Steve and the others and, and so forth, and Greg, who are keeping that going around the Socialist Register. You have every right to be proud and happy about what you do, and we all need you to continue to do it. Thank you. Uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Rick, for sharing this um, powerful speech and also your um, uh, um, thoughts on all the debates and uh, the connection to Neil. Um, um, it would be great, as you mentioned, that if Neil could be here today and join all of these discussions or the questions you and other panelists have raised uh, would be so wonderful. Um, now, uh, we still have a few minutes before we, uh, the panel ends. And um, if the panelists uh, would like to address each other, uh, to talk to each other, this would be a great time to do so. Any questions, any comments from each other? Yeah, we can take questions among the entire group as well. And so any questions from the audience, any, any, or from other panelists? Yes, let me see. Um, um, yes, Rose. Rose, can you unmute yourself? I think you're muted. Um, 
And um, there is a question for many. Um, discuss the question of imperialism in the system today. Anyone from the, the panel that wants to address this? What is the question? The question is, um, discuss the question of imperialism today. Um, what do we mean by imperialism? Is the concept still useful, meaningful, um, provide any guidance, etc.? So anyone who wants to share their opinion would be great. Okay, so could I respond? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think if anyone had any doubts about whether imperialism was uh, alive and kicking, they should all have been dispelled in the last couple of years. So if you consider imperialism, as I mentioned, as, as the struggle over economic territory by large capital supported by states, we have vaccine imperialism, we have fiscal imperialism, we have imperialism over natural resources, we have inter imperialism of intellectual property, we have imperialism over land, we have imperialism over labor, control over labor. I mean, I, I'm just listing the different forms of economic territory. Uh, we have imperialism of diff over different forms of nature. We have imperialism about cyberspace and digital, whatever you want to call that, the digital commons. So I don't think there's any sphere of our life today that is not pervaded by imperialism. Uh, so if ever there was a concept that is extraordinarily relevant and contemporary, that's the one. Thank you, Jadi. Anyone else? Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, Rose, if you want to, if you can unmute and, and talk, you can raise the question. Or if you cannot uh, unmute yet, you can type your question in the chat and we can all see it. Okay, while we're wait, waiting, yes, uh, from, from Greg, uh, mainly for Clive, but also, I guess, for all the, the panelists, uh, the impact of the rise of China for thinking about globalization in the state. Any thoughts, Clive? Uh, I'm not so sure I have. Yeah, you know, that's obviously a very important question, but I think I will defer somewhat uh, on the issue that you know, it's something I've really only seriously begun to think about recently. Uh, I think we see all the, the evidence that China is certainly a rising power. I think one of the both economically, well, economically, politically, and military, and as others have pointed out earlier today, uh, much of what Biden is doing right now is in no way, you know, it's, quote, socialistic. It's designed to strengthen the competitive capacities of American capital in relation to China. So a great deal of it is a response to China. I suppose a background question that I always think about, my students always ask me about it, is the whole question, is, is China capitalist or is China some type of market socialism? Uh, or does it simply offer a different version of capitalism? If I heard Richard correctly, I think his argument was that China has become the most dynamic capitalist nation in the world system today. And it offers a fundamentally different kind of capitalism than the neoliberalism that we've been used to uh, in North America, Western Europe, and Japan. So, you know, if I projected that out into, into the future, 25, 30, 40 years, uh, do you end up with a confrontation between two forms of capitalism, sort of uh, a re rebirth of, of Lenin's struggle between capitalist powers? I don't know, uh, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that before I say something silly. Thank you, Clyde. Um, anyone else wants to address that question? Okay, um, there is another question in the chat uh, from Greg. Uh, are we seeing treasury departments retaking primacy over central banks? If so, would this be a central marker of the end of neoliberalism? Anyone? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I just have to interject here. This is so Northern. 
treasury departments are taking over from central banks in about 11 countries in the world. So let's get real on this one. And it just goes back to the earlier point I made. So I do think, I, I mean, I'm sure Leo would have said we must have a broader global perspective. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Doc, you, you wanted to... Well, yeah, um, I'm not quite sure what Greg is talking about here because you know, the Treasury Department under Trump was a joke. And uh, the, the, um, the Federal Reserve was the only serious game in town. Uh, and Powell was quite... And, you know, even Bernanke in, in earlier times were quite open about how uh, they were uh, taking um, stimulative action because uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the central government was really politically unable to mount any kind of serious uh, fiscal stimulus. That's not true this time around, of course, but, uh, you know, in the, in, for much of the Trump years um, and then, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Treasury Department was uh, just preposterous. It was thinly staffed, and uh, the, the staff that was on the scene was a, a bunch of uh, bunch of amateurs. So, you know, I think Yell Yellen now, coming back, is a much more serious and substantial figure. Um, and um, talking about injecting the Treasury into climate and all kinds of things, but I'm really not quite clear on uh, what, uh, what Greg has in mind here. Great. Thank you, Doc. Um... Uh, th there are more questions now. Um, one question is from the Q&A. Um, what do you think of the Russia-China alliance and its potential impact on global capitalism? Is something that uh, anyone can respond? Well, I think I would ask the question, what Russia-China alliance are we talking about? Okay. Um, well, if, if you know um, VRO, if you want to uh, follow up on the question, um, following Clyde's, uh, please feel free to do so. Now, here's a longer question from Jason. Um, this is a question for for Sam, but I guess um, anyone in the panel can respond. Do you think that you may have been too sanguine that a new era of interimperialist rivalry? was unlikely to come as the current relationship between the US and China. Despite how intertwined our national economies remain, looks rather Cold War. I think we are seeing the return of interimperialist rivalry, even though Leo was certainly right that communist, quote unquote, China had become an integral part of global capitalism. This is related to all the questions before that. Um, so, um, Anyone who wants to uh, talk about how was the U.S.-China relationship or the change of that, uh, what's the implication for global capitalism nowadays? These are like huge questions. I think everyone's just a little hesitant to jump in here. I mean, it's not really one you just want to riff on. Um, but I think that the question of China and particularly, you know, now we're in a kind of strange period because we're, you know, sort of Obama redux with, with Biden. And so we're kind of expecting Biden to move forward in a way that um, mirrors you know, the, the decisions to kind of half uh, antagonize China in terms of, you know, moving into the South Pacific Sea and, and sort of reorienting kind of global military strategy, while at the same time, um, you know, we saw this deeper integration uh, economically between China and the U.S. And certainly, you know, China's 2025 visions rely on the um, persistence and deepening of the kind of U.S.-led global political economic order um, of the last 30 years, something that Trump was trying to move away from, but didn't, I think, do so successfully. So I think it's, I mean, a general point is that it's extremely important to problematize the question of whether we're seeing a new Cold War with China, but to do that in a way that's really grounded um, in empirical data and as Jayati raised, uh, is not just, you know, through the lens of the U.S. looking out, but is actually taking sort of global flows seriously um, 
and that can be hard to do uh, when there's so much kind of political instrumental posturing about the role of China. So that's not really an answer to the question, but I think that you know if we're or if we're actually going to take seriously um, the legacy of of Leo in being empirically grounded, I think that the role of China and the relationship of China and the United States is a really important place um, to begin because it's it's really kind of up in the air, I think, what's going to happen between the U.S. and China in the, in the next few years. But at the same time, there's really, I think we have to be honest about the um, dependence of China and the United States on each other uh, economically and on the, the current kind of um, political economic framework of the global economy. And that's not so easy to, to sort of um, dismiss. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, here's another question. Um, we haven't really talked much about the uh, working class in the global south. Now, um, uh, there has long been the debates, the discussion about the unity of uh, workers in global north and south. Do you think uh, in, the, in, you know, in, in, in global capitalism nowadays, uh, can we still talk about unity um, um, uh, among workers in the north and south? Anyone in the panel? Would, yeah. Um, can respond to this. All right, I know all the questions are really, you know, big questions, and it's not easy to to respond in, in a few in a few sentences. Um, uh, um, Okay, let me let me use my privilege to ask uh, 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 um, uh, Rick and um, Jadi. Oh, Jadi has just left. Rick and um, 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 and, uh, and Nicole uh, about the the question that uh, Rick has mentioned that the uh, the, the the capitalism has really been declined in the West at least. Um, and 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 you said we know where that the dynamic center now is. Um, I assume you're talking about China, or yes. the, uh, yeah. when? including India, maybe. Um, oh, China. Just China. But the question is, do you think the, it's really going to be another cycle of capitalism, or this is even you know, uh, China being the more dynamic part of capitalism is not going to save capitalism globally. What? Yes. If, I, if I can respond just on a few a few of the comments that were made, and maybe this will stimulate at least via disagreement. Um, Janet Yellen and I were classmates in graduate school and getting our degrees in economics. She had the exact same teachers I did, the exact same classes, the exact same curriculum. She's a person who believes in fiscal policy. How she ended up in the Fed, that has to do with bureaucratic uh, notions, but her commitment is a, an old liberal democratic notion of deficit spending a la Keynes to bail capitalism out of its own mess. And that's her same formation basically now, but she's in charge of the Fed and I think Doug is right. That's where the action is. Uh, but think of her as a fiscal policy manipulator using monetary policy, uh, number one. Number two, in my understanding, and I have you know, personal connections, let me assure you, the people at the highest levels of the United States are very worried, at least in the government. I don't mingle with CEOs, I don't know what they think or whether they do. But the people in charge of the government at this point um, are very, very worried. They're worried about their failure to prepare for or manage COVID. They're worried about their failure to prepare for or manage this predictable economic crash. The NBER has the uh, downturn starting in February, which was a month before the COVID hit here. They don't know what to do. They don't understand why they're getting worse. This one even worse than the one in 2008 or nine. And they don't know what to do. Number three, they have been trying now for several years under Bush, under Biden, to do things to China 
to make the Chinese adjust and change their policies in a variety of ways that they want. And every effort to do that to date has failed. And they are not unaware of that reality. They don't have the power. They don't have the leverage that they thought they had. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. And I don't know the answer to that question either, but I can assure you they don't. And what you're seeing is a lot of rhetorical lashing around to get the time for them to be able to figure out what in the world they can do. And, and you know, the, the single most important statistic that they wrestle with is that the United States has 4% of the world's population and accounts for 20% of the world's deaths from COVID. This reality, they don't know how to handle or even to understand what it means in terms of their imperialist projects. You, it's very hard to maintain a global empire when you misfunction as badly as this system is now doing. And that is as important to them as any other dimension of currency or anything else that the political economy points to. And I think you're, you're, you're beginning to see a crisis of legitimacy in the United States government at the highest level among its leaders. They don't know what's happening and how to control any of it that seems to matter. And they're very, very anxious. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, uh, Nicole, do you have anything to respond to this? Um, well, this is like a huge conversation. <laughs> it's hard to kind of jump in. I think that there are a few ways to, for me, I'll say, there's a few ways that I've been kind of trying to parse out what's going on because I agree with Rick that it is a really confusing time. And there are a few points of confusion. Um, one is the kind of inability to achieve growth through monetary policy. Um, and yet there are no um, other kind of alternatives. Like they, the, the, the ruling class has been mouthing support for a switch to kind of fiscal stimulus for the past 10 years and it hasn't really happened, right? We're completely dependent on this new normal of you know, kind of engineered low interest rates, not just in the United States, but in you know, leading countries around the world. And what the kind of end point of that is, um, is unclear. I mean, how long is this sustainable? That's not entirely obvious. But at the same time, when we talk about, you know, following the 2008 to 2010 financial crisis and the uh, crisis of legitimacy for neoliberalism that followed, it's been over, you know, it's been 10 years since that, more than 10 years. And what has actually been um, the, the kind of upshot of that crisis, right? Well, in some ways, we definitely see um, continued and increased pain for the working class, but we don't see a kind of breakdown um, in a systematic way. Instead, I think we see the kind of, you know, some people call it zombie neoliberalism, but we do see the persistence and flexibility and robustness of global capitalism and, it re and a continued reliance on the United States in, you know, in superintending that um, system. Now, this doesn't mean that um, there isn't a kind of transition. I agree with Rick that the United States, their, all of their policies on kind of uh, changing China from without and, and thinking that they were going to be able to tr transform China into a liberal democracy, that has been abandoned for sure. It hasn't worked. But, you know, the kind of um, predictive ability to see China as the new hegemon um, to organize a new model of global capitalism, that's also to me very unclear. Uh, and I definitely don't see the, the kind of ultimate cliff and the destruction or, uh, you know, um, implosion of global capitalism. I don't see that either. So none of this is to say, I think that I agree in the general sense that, um, you know, we don't really know what the future holds. It's a confusing time. But I think that 
Leo and, and Sam and, you know, myself, the kind of resistance to what we've called declinism is the broader kind of way of saying uh, we need to remain empirically grounded and questioning and relying on data to understand where trends are going rather than to, um, you know, rely on a kind of um, belief that this is the big one. Um, and I think that uh, is kind of where, where I'm at in terms of thinking about the future. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Clyde, do you want to briefly respond? Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna make a rather facile point here, but I think it's always worth remembering. Uh, coming from a standpoint of state theory, there always seems to be a tendency to give the capitalist class or its representatives virtually omniscient capacities to solve problems and to resolve crises. I think it's worth remembering Ruling classes make mistakes all the time. They misjudge, they miscalculate, they adopt the wrong policies. Uh, Doug talked about some of those. So I, I think it, it's always important to take that sort of empirical historical level of analysis and to understand that you know, the ruling class can mess up and very badly. Thank you, Clyde, very much. Um, so Doug, do you have any last comments on this? Uh, yes, uh, whoops. Sorry. Um, yeah, I had a couple of comments to make. First of all, we did have two giant fiscal packages, each about 10% of GDP. So that, and to see that coming out of Trump was a remarkable departure for a Republican administration. So, uh, you know, the, we, we, we haven't seen that kind of stimulus, especially uh, that one after another within a matter of months uh, ever, really. I'm far larger than anything we saw in the 1930s. Um, so it, it is a remarkable change. Something is going on there. Um, we don't really, I don't really know what it is, but something is going on there. Uh, but uh, and I would just want to put in another word for my decline of the ruling class idea. You know, you look at China, they are run by, in many ways, a very brutal, um, very undemocratic system, but they have the capacity to think in the long term. And the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, huge in scale, but also uh, both in, in, in monetary terms, physical terms, time terms, um, it, it really large imperial ambitions. That's just that kind of um, ambition uh, and vision is really gone from our ruling class now. It's nothing like that of the mid uh, 20th century American ruling class, uh, you know, the grand old man of, of, of foreign policy of, of the mid 20th century, where they really did have a vision uh, and a discipline uh, and a political sense. I mean, they all <laughs> crashed in Vietnam, but, you know, the, the, the folks who were running things from the 30s into the 60s, um, you know, had a pretty good idea of what they were doing. I just don't see that we have anything remotely comparable to that now. I think, you know, the, I once heard George Soros at the, um, at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he said the U.S. has shot its wa, and he stopped himself before he said wad. But, you know, I think there's something like that going on here. The, the, the United States really, you know, uh, and, and I don't think we're going to decline gracefully, but uh, I think we really are in decline. And the fact that the United States owes China something like a trillion dollars in treasury debt. Um, I always used to argue with Leo and to Sam too about this. Uh, I thought that really mattered. It was Even if it was not a material power of a creditor over a debtor, it managed, it, it was a sign of something shifting in, in uh, world uh, economic and political power. Uh, so uh, when you owe somebody else a trillion dollars, the, uh, you know, that's not a sign of strength. Thank you very much, um, Doug, and thanks for everyone that uh, has participated in the event. Many, would you take over? Am I here? Oh, you can see me. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Jun, for your uh, hosting uh, this uh, panel. Um, I think there's a lot of disagreement on these questions, and uh, I, I imagine if we were here for several, um, maybe 45 minutes or an hour, we would have some very interesting discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this event at the Left Forum, uh, uh, you know, especially Michael Pelius. Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Matt Benetti. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Rachel Scott. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank um, uh, Rick Wolf uh, as a member of the, uh, the, the board, a, a, as well as Rob Robinson. And um, I, I'd like to thank all those who helped put together this event, uh, which was, uh, I think, very successful. And um, uh, I would now would like to turn over the final comments to uh, a person that many of us will find quite familiar, 
Um, he, uh, Eric Canepa, uh, who is a, a harpsichordist, a musicologist. He uh, is uh, a leader in uh, the, the European group Transform. Uh, he's been a coordinator of the Left Forum Social Scholars Conference uh, between 2001 and 2006. And um, he also has coordinated with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. So um, I think it's very fitting uh, for Eric to close out this, um, this conference. And we hope to have many more in the months uh, to come, as well as next year when we come back in person. Okay, you've got the floor, Eric. Is Eric here? Yeah, yeah, no, I've unmuted now. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay, good. I mean, uh, look, okay, um, first of all, I have to apologize for the poor lighting. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, uh, you know, thank you for asking me to say some concluding words. Uh, that you've asked me to say something about the history of Left Forum. So what I'd like to do is suggest the role of the Socialist Scholars Conference and Left Forum what is, have played in the face of the particular hurdles the left has had to overcome in the U.S. and also relate this to Socialist Register and to Leo's salutary influence on the process. Thinking back on it, the left in the U.S. had to weather a difficult period before, and it sounds funny to say it, but before the social question came back. I mean, the issue of inequality posed at the level of the whole society and with the mediations of real politics. Another way people express this politics in the past is what you do in, to put it mildly, non-revolutionary times. Um, in, just a second, I, I've lost it. In the, in the light of the um, recent traction the US left has gained with the popularity of class-wide initiatives like Medicare for All and through the Bernie campaigns, et cetera, we can't help seeing the preceding period by contrast as a long winter, although with exhilarating moments of some large and at times effective protest movements. I'm sure many of us have thought back to those days and asked ourselves how people stayed sane and maintained a viable politics that allowed them to remain socialist today. Who weathered the period? Who didn't? Whose politics aren't, uh, are dated now or aren't dated now? Uh, the radical left in the United States uh, has always been burdened by a problem rooted in the very origins of the country, the country derived from Puritan separatist sects with frontier individualism and a tendency to retreat from the density and complexity of urban society. It has always been a particular challenge to develop a sense of what a dialectical negation of the prevailing order would feel like. The idea is very hard to grasp that at at the same time as we need to have critical distance from capitalist society and understand the need for a radical break with its central mechanisms, we also have to create this change, this break, out of the very material of the society and its culture as a development within the current society. It's hard to grasp everywhere, but especially so in the U.S. Added to this core problem in U.S. history was the break enforced by McCarthyism in the economic boom years of the Cold War, which radically separated the left from working class organizations so that the new left emerging in the 1960s was no longer mainly oriented to the domestic working class, although there were more labor organizing initiatives than have generally been acknowledged. Uh, the well-known symptoms accompanying this separation from the indigenous working population were a romanticizing of the so-called third world, and the scarcity of any strategic perspective other than attacking society from the outside, reducing the protest to the point that Ajaz Ahmad could say that the US left, while fulfilling the honorable and necessary function of, imposing, of opposing US imperialism, seemed to be a left searching for people. At least this is what tended to characterize the left that saw itself as radical. And the Socialist Scholars Conference and all this, in the 1960s, the conference, mixing mostly academics from the new left with those close to the CPUSA, was primarily a place to present scholarly work, uh, but an activist public uh, interacted with the scholars. At any rate, it definitely raised the level of analysis available to the left at the time, 
although of course its impact was mostly limited to the New York area. After a brief hiatus, the uh, Social Scholars Conference was refounded in 1981 by Bogdan Denich, Stanley Aronowitz, and leading personalities of what was to become Democratic Socialists of America, which was a 1983 fusion of DSOC, a social democratic grouping whose best known personality was Michael Harrington, and the more radical New American movement. A year later, the conference moved to Burr of Manhattan Community College, where it enjoyed the active support of the socialist chancellor of the City University, Joseph Murphy, giving it nearly unlimited space and many advantages. A consensus was reached between Denich and Paul Sweezy. The conference was to be a big tent for all. DSA could determine the plenaries, but no one was left out. Murphy's, Murphy's sponsorship, Harrington's prestige and reach, the big institutional setting, and DSA's ability to draw US elected officials and social democratic representatives from Europe and elsewhere made for the largest and least sectarian, explicitly socialist, annual gathering in the US. And this throughout the, and this occurred throughout the Reagan years, a stone's throw from Wall Street. It was certainly salutary to expose the US radical left to these different currents and potentially to hear about a, what a left politics could be uh, like in other core capitalist countries, but the obstacles were still too great. I was struck by the polarization. If there were panels on Europe, they were straight out establishment uh, social de democratic policy wonk panels organized by the Ebert Foundation, for example, with no connection to the average conference goers. And they, 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 did, they didn't go to them, even if they occasionally had interesting speakers. There was a brick wall between them and the radical left pu uh, public. The occasional exception, the presence of representatives of Italy's Il Manifesto or Germany's Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which began to have a steady presence by the late 90s, did not make much of a dent in this polarization until recent years. And this is where the Socialist Scholars Conference panels with Leo and his comrades in the Socialist Register came in from the very start. I remember my first impression of what struck me as novel then. Here was an anti-capitalist transformational politics that wasn't preserved through intellectual and political anemia, that was not severed from the richness of experience of the actually existing socialist and labor movements in the advanced capitalist countries, but that came out of a critical engagement with them, which gave us access to some of those experiences, for instance, of the labor left in Britain. Of course, there were others, including everyone who was active then that's now speaking in this uh, conference, uh, speaking in this event today, whose politics were sturdy enough to survive the period. It's just that Socialist Register was the publication that conspicuously concentrated in one place this uh, a high level of, of, of thinking. So I think Leo and Socialist Register were a crucial element in maintaining a sane and politically mature strand of left socialist thinking in North America which later had its greatest impact in the left after Occupy and after the first Sanders campaign. A quick word on Leo's personality, and this is more or less what Fran was saying. He couldn't have been more distant from that puritanism and aestheticization of marginality so characteristic of much of the US protest left. I can't help thinking that Leo's very embrace and enjoyment of life, his warm-hearted Yiddish word is Menschlichkeit, may have in some measure exerted a salutary influence in North American radical left milieus during the recent tendency to move from protest to politics within the socialist left. Um, in 2000, Bogdan Denich asked me to coordinate the conference. Without Murphy's patronage, the conference had lost most of its advantages at, at BMCC and it was time to move. But we also attempted something else. The idea was to maintain the inclusive big tent approach, but to even out the disparity between the big plenaries that were largely under the influence of DSA, which is politically not really the same organization as today's DSA, and all the rest, which were simply slots given to any individual or organization that wanted to organize them on their own. This naturally resulted in duplications of the same topic in several panels differentiated by political milieu which didn't ever have to talk to each other. 
Instead, we attempted to greatly reduce the number of panels to actually plan half of them directly and then try to get at least some of the organizations to combine panels and confront different points of view. Now, I should also say, on the other hand, that slugfests between people with widely divergent views should not crowd out sessions presenting work by co-thinkers, since it's crucial that people have a space to develop a common orientation and analysis. But in the big plenaries, the DSA, DSA media had to be mixed in with others. It was very tricky and demanded a lot of strategizing and negotiation. Nothing could be done automatically. Perhaps it was too ambitious, but I'm still convinced that it's worth attempting to shape a large chunk of the conference. Short time later, we were able to form a planning board for the first time, which formalized the organizational process. Now, because of the 2004 split in the board, we had to rename the conference that inherited the uh, SSC's activity, but not the legal entity. The name Left Forum was a logical choice and fit with the big tent approach and a left that was hardly unified around a socialist identity by then. Now, unfortunately, it seems a bit out of sync with the new attractiveness of the word socialist in the US, although perhaps not in Europe where the tendency still seems to be the renaming of socialist organizations as left. In recent years, I've been too uninvolved with left forum to speak about it with any authority, but it's absolutely clear that it's grown and it's accomplished remarkable things in the last 10 years with many, many memorable events. And it's a great achievement. Um, but I'll end by saying that um, I remember back in the 2000s, people I considered sectarian who hated the conference telling me that the tragedy of its possible disappearance would be far greater than the positive effect of its existence. If they thought this, imagine how unacceptable its disappearance would be for the rest of us. But luckily, that doesn't have to be, and I'm obviously not alone in welcoming the current effort to keep it alive and develop it. And I have no doubt that Leo, were he to be with us, would be part of the effort. Thank you.